I tried to make a video earlier, but it was just too noisy, so I had to find somewhere more quiet. So I'm going to try again. Anyway, I made it as far as Doha. I've had lots of delays. Uh, I just made my plane in Seattle, so I didn't have time to post anything then. Now, what I wanted to talk about was this uh, wheel of samsara. So you may know, samsara in Sanskrit means wheel. And what it's referring to is cyclic existence. So Buddha taught that our mundane world is like a cycle. We pass from one life to the next, sometimes experiencing pleasure and happiness and sometimes experiencing hellish realms, unsatisfactory realms. And that we're trapped in this cycle of happiness and suffering and indifference. And then we just go around and around and around and this whole thing is basically meaningless. It doesn't get us anywhere. As long as we're within the uh, samsaric wheel, then we will never find liberation or awakening or emancipation. So there's the turning of the wheel of samsara, but there's also the turning of the wheel of the Dharma. And these are two very different things. So the Buddha taught the Dharma. He taught a spiritual path. This is what we call turning the wheel of the Dharma. And there are three of these. There's the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, which is the wheel of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And that is generally associated with the Hinayana or Theravadin tradition, but it's the foundation of all Buddhist practice. And then there's the second turning of the Wheel of Dharma, which is the teachings on emptiness. And many Westerners will be familiar with this, this concept of emptiness. And then there's the final turning of the Wheel of Dharma, which is the Wheel of Dharma uh, that teaches that all phenomena are free of having any characteristics or signs. It's the wheel of signlessness. Exactly what that means is difficult, but it's generally associated with the Vajrayana. So the first turning of the wheel of Dharma is loosely associated with the Hinayana, but applies to all vehicles. The second turning is basically the teachings of the Mahayana. And the third turning of the wheel of Dharma is associated specifically with the Vajrayana practice. And that's quite a complicated topic. What I wanted to talk about, however, was this idea of cyclic existence or this turning wheel of samsara, this mundane wheel of samsara. Now we should know that there are three types. There's the physical wheel of samsara, there's the verbal wheel of samsara, and there's the mental wheel of samsara. And here primarily I want to talk about this physical wheel of samsara, because people get the idea that samsara is just an analogy. It's kind of like a story. So that's not the case. This physical wheel of samsara is all around us. And it becomes extremely obvious uh, when you have to travel internationally. Because then you become directly involved in the machinations of the modern world and to quite a great intensity. This came to mind when I was leaving Seattle because I looked behind our plane and there was a, a queue of 20 other planes all lined up all ready to hit that runway, take off, and go off to various different destinations all over the world. Well, this really sums up our kind of global kind of community we have. It's all interconnected, and it's all very, very busy. I mean, you can just think about it in terms of when you make an order on Amazon, for example. Then there's this entire system kind of made up around the internet, and then you've got this as your portal for acquiring new stuff, and new possessions and it all kind of comes to your front door through this really complex logistics that uh, kind of permeates every aspect of our modern life. Well this is the physical wheel of samsara and we're very much involved with this whether we're worldly people or spiritual people there's just no way to escape it. Unfortunately there are those who seemingly fall off the wheel of samsara and it's especially prevalent these days in North America. There are so many homeless people, drug addicts, who have kind of just fallen off the whole system. They just can't catch up with the pace of modern life, and they've been left behind. Well, really, they're not left behind. They're being dragged along with us. 
and they're just not having a very good time of it. But for most of us, then we are riding this perpetual wheel of samsara. Our daily lives are just wrapped up in the busyness and the craziness of modern life, especially if you live in cities, especially if you live in uh, developed nations. I just wanted to add something here. When I say Westerners and Easterners, I'm using this term very loosely. When I say Westerner, really what I mean is people living in developed nations whose primary form of education is based on Western institutions. So they get a Western education and also they basically have faith in Western science. Uh, Western culture is very sort of influential in their lives. So that really applies to many, many people, probably the majority of the world these days. Uh, sadly, even the very, very poor people in for example, in Nepal, are highly sort of influenced by this Western world, even though they can't afford it, they can't buy into it. Because of advertising, because of smartphones, etc., then they kind of know what's going on in the world, and they don't really have much access to our wealth and our luxury. Nonetheless, then they aspire towards it. And so many sort of poor people from Nepal spend all their lives just trying to make it to the West. Like the West is some kind of pure land, some heavenly realm. They've got it in their minds that everything is glittering. I mean, just look around me. It's all shiny and bright and stainless steel and glass. As I was coming off the plane, it just hit me in the face how intense it is really. This intense and rampant materialism is everywhere. And it's even more prominent or poignant when you come to places like airports. The immense amount of wealth that just exists in those duty-free shops. It's just staggering. It's everything. Jewelry, iPhones, computers, luggage, fashion, perfumes, anything you can imagine. It's all there, just waiting to be purchased. I mean, that's a, quite an extreme example of our modern, sort of Western world. But uh, to a lesser degree, then it exists everywhere because we're all kind of influenced by what we see on the internet, on television. And as I said, even poor people in Nepal uh, can see what's going on all over the world. It's actually a big problem in monasteries because the young monks, they see all this uh, kind of sensational stuff going on on somebody's iPhone and they start wanting to know what it's all about. They start getting addicted to it even before they've even, even experienced it. So many young monks uh, disrobe and uh, try to run away to the West, try to make a life out of it. But sadly, they often don't uh, have a very good time. They end up doing really menial jobs and uh, being kind of deprecated and looked down upon. They become third-class citizens. And uh, they kind of regret it after a while. It's not as sort of all it's made up to be, right? Our Western world looks very nice on the outside, but on the inside, everyone is really struggling. They're struggling with mental illness, uh, neuroses, depression, low self-image, etc. Now, why do I want to talk about this, this wheel of samsara, this physical wheel of samsara? Well, it's one of the most harmful things to a spiritual practitioner because we get carried away, we get caught up in this machination of the capitalist society and we get carried away and it just eats up all our time. I mean, as I said previously in a recent video, then there's this way that the Tibetans look at it. They say when you're very young, well, you're very sharp intellect and you learn things quickly, but you're completely immature, right? So you just have no kind of spiritual knowledge whatsoever. And then when you, when you sort of get a little bit older, you go to start going to school and your, your life maybe, you know, in the West, you know, 20 years or something gets eaten up in education. Education is a good thing. I'm not uh, slagging off education. I think education is wonderful, but it takes up all your time, right? And then as soon as you've finished your education, then you've got to get a job. And once you've matured enough, you've grown up, you've got your education or your qualifications, and then you get into working life, and that really eats up your time. And for most people, then they get married, they have children, or they form families, you know, they don't necessarily have to be in a kind of binary couple. Uh, but this kind of forming partnerships turns into kind of a business deal becomes like a corporation really. A family is a small version of a kind of business or a corporation. And then you, you can't really give up on it. Once you've started, it's very difficult just to leave it aside, unless you're very irresponsible and selfish individual and you just run away. But what happens for most of us is through this process, our entire life gets eaten up. 
our, the time we could be spending to develop spiritual knowledge just disappears. And then in the end, once we retire, we're kind of finished, you know? We're no longer sharp in our intellect. Our body doesn't allow us to be diligent anymore. Even if we wanted to sit down for hours in meditation, our knees would start to hurt, etc. We start uh, suffering from various different kind of uh, degenerative diseases and it, it becomes very difficult. So really, when we are free, and we no longer have anything to do. We're sort of retired, as they say, and that's it. We're, we've, passed, we've passed our prime. We're no longer able to practice the Dharma. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. You should. I mean, if you're old like me and you've had a worldly life, then it's always beneficial, and especially if you're a Buddhist, because if you're a Buddhist, then you believe in future lives. So you're setting the grounds uh, for future manifestations, and that's the most important thing. I mean, my Lama always tells this story about an American woman who only got her uh, doctorate, or she became an MD or something like that, when she was in her 90s. And that's quite amazing. Because really, when you're in your 90s, it's not like you have much time left in this world to practice your medicine, right? Or your doctorate. Uh, so maybe she had a kind of Buddhist way of thinking about things. And um, that is, and she had a way of thinking in which, well, this is benefit no matter what. Even if I don't use this in this lifetime, it's still beneficial. Well, for us Buddhists, then it's very beneficial. If you establish the habits for education, and if you're diligent, then that's something you carry with you from lifetime to lifetime, and you progress further and further. You get closer and closer to Buddhahood. Uh, that's the way we see it, anyway. I mean, what Buddhahood means is to sort of clear away all negativities, and also increase all positive qualities. So there's two aspects to Buddhahood, and that's what the term Buddha means in Tibetan. It means to purify and to increase. Now again, I've wandered off the main topic here. The point I wanted to talk about this perpetual, unrelenting wheel of samsara, of mundane activity, is because many Western practitioners have heard of this notion that you can practice with your daily life. Uh, the term in Tibetan is either take your negative emotions onto the path or take appearances onto the path. So appearances are how our world manifests. Now this is what it's taught. It is a very profound practice. Uh, you know, I've got nothing against this practice. I think it's amazing. But the problem is most of us aren't able to do this. The reason why is because you have to have some mental stability in your own practice before you'll ever have a hope of taking your desire, your anger, your jealousy, your pride onto the path. That means making it a spiritual practice. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And it's not for beginners. And it's not for people who haven't achieved mental stability. Now what it means to achieve mental stability, it means that you have control over this mental wheel of samsara. Remember this is the physical wheel of samsara. That's this crazy, mundane, uh, busy activity just to feed ourselves and keep ourselves going, to stave off enemies, you know, to protect what's ours. This is our kind of physical wheel of karma. Uh, this verbal wheel of karma is how we perpetuate our negativity through our speech. And we do it, you know, as soon as we open our mouth, we're criticizing others. You know, even if you don't like somebody, then it's taught to, it's not good. It's, you know, not beneficial to go around criticizing people. So I guess I'm creating a lot of verbal uh, negativity because uh, I seem to always be criticizing other people. You know, depends what you believe. And then there's this mental wheel of activity, this mental wheel of samsara, and that is the way our thoughts get carried away. We fall under the sway of our negative emotions. So, for example, in this airport, as I walk along, then there's all this, you know, glitzy, glamorous stuff to buy, you know, shining gold and diamonds and jewels and iPhones. For me, when I was younger, I liked technology. So for me, the, the trap is things like iPhones and laptops and all this new technology. And so when you see that, your mind is immediately attracted to it, right? We all know what this is like. It's like if you see a big billboard, you know? then your mind is immediately attracted to that. And not only that, but the people who make these displays, the people who uh, do the advertising are very skilled, right? They've studied how to attract people's attention. And on top of that, the entire capitalist system is based on feeding into people's greed. There's a problem here, and that's because our worldly resources are limited. 
but desire is taught to be limitless. So are you able to practice with desire? Are you able to practice with anger? For example, many Westerners like the idea of engaging in spiritual sexual practices. I think this uh, happens a lot in the Osho community. Now, there are these practices. They exist in Taoism. They exist in, uh, you know, in all different kinds of spirituality. In Hinduism, they have got tantric sex practices. Uh, these are valid paths of taking negative emotions onto the path, making them into spirituality. The problem is that we're not there yet. We're not able to do these practices purely. So what happens is they just feed into our already out of control desire, our desire for things, our desire for experiences like bliss, you know, well-being. It only fuels the flames of our desire fuels the flames of our anger. It's not something that ever becomes practice. It only sends us down to the lower realms. So the way it's described in Buddhism, it's like salt water, you know? If you, if you drink salt water, it doesn't quench your thirst. It just makes you more thirsty. And it's the same thing. If you are an immature spiritual practitioner, and let me be honest, 99.9999% of us are immature spiritual practitioners, then if you feed into your let's say, sexual desire, it's only going to increase and it's only going to make your life more difficult. Now, whether you believe me or not, I don't know, you know. I'm sure many of you spiritual practitioners have tried to practice with your negative emotions. But it's a massive trap. It's a, it's a huge obstacle. Because many people go down this path and it leads them astray. And they turn out quite strange and very odd things happen. And especially within spiritual communities, things often go wrong because of this. Arabic is such a beautiful language. Attention, please. For security Don't know what you're saying. Any baggage left unattended will be removed by security personnel. So when we try to practice with our desire, all it does is make us more desirous. And being more desirous is something that merely increases our suffering. It's very clear to us that somebody, for example, who's got a problem with heroin, that if they feed into that, then their life only gets worse. It doesn't improve in any way. And so as long as you're immature, then feeding into your desire, your lust, whatever you have, will only make that, that much worse. And as I said, then this is a big problem within spiritual communities. And often spiritual communities go wrong because of these things. Because the teacher teaches a high view, for example, taking the kleshas, taking the negative emotions onto the path, using appearances as our practice, and their students aren't ready for it. And so when you teach immature people high views, then they're capable of anything. And terrible things happen. I mean, Jonestown, what happened with Charles Manson, the Osho community. There are many examples of this. This is not at all a rare occurrence. This happens a lot in spiritual communities. And you have to be very careful. And primarily, you have to gain control of this mental wheel of samsara. And you do that through your practice, through meditation. And to start off with, it's done through very simple placement meditation, placing your mind on an object or focusing on a concept, uh, focusing on a visualization, and doing that repeatedly. I mean, what we do in the Buddha Dharma is we have these nine stages for stabilization of the mind. And they're something that anybody can practice. They're very, very simple and very, very practical. And the more, uh, the more slowly you take this progress, and the more simple you make it, then the more mental stability you develop. And we use things just like, for example, a little black stone or something. And th the problem is most Westerners, they reject this kind of practice. They see it as being very lowly. They look down on it. But until you actually have this mental acuity, then there's no way for you to progress on to Mahamudra or Vajrayana or, you know, practice with a consort, etc. You're just, you're just kidding yourself on. It's just self-deception. It's never going to take you anywhere. And in fact, it leads to very negative results. I've seen many people who have made this mistake. And then, you know, when they get to be maybe 50s and 60s, they turn out really strange. They become very odd people and they are also capable of hurting others uh, quite a lot. And this isn't only a danger for students, it's also a danger for teachers. And here's the main problem with these teachers, is that uh, becoming famous isn't a sign that you're spiritually advanced. This is the mistake that most Westerners make. 
They think if a teacher is famous, that automatically means that they have some spiritual power or realization. And that's not true. That's not the case. Because all kinds of people became famous in the past, right? Adolf Hitler was incredibly famous and very, very powerful and very, very popular in Germany. And, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin is very, very popular in Russia. So it doesn't mean you're spiritually advanced. Uh, what it's taught in the Buddha Dharma is, is that in gaining a large retinue, having lots of followers, for example, Andrew Tate has lots of followers on um, I don't know, Twitter or something like that, on social media. Uh, that comes from having practiced patience in previous lives. So being very tolerant to others and patient with others, uh, then in future lives, you gather uh, people close to you who look up to you. And so you could be very spiritually immature and then gain lots of followers. And this is a death trap for a spiritual community and for a spiritual teacher. Because people have a very strong herd mentality. And then if there's sort of a leader, like a sort of king figure or something like that, and then they very quickly develop a misplaced loyalty. They're willing to do anything for that person. And when spiritually immature individuals gain power over large groups of people, then they start getting all kinds of funny ideas. Like, well, I'm special, you know. I can get drunk, I can take drugs, I can have lots of girlfriends or boyfriends, I can do whatever I want because I'm, you know, enlightened, I'm a Buddha, etc. But this notion that they're special gets reinforced by the students. And then there's another danger because the teacher wants to increase this high they get off of being famous, right? It's like rock stars, right? I know about this. I used to be a musician. And there's this real addictive thing about having lots of people in an audience cheering you on. It really gets, gets us going. Because we're ordinary beings, we love praise, and we hate when people uh, defame us or tell us off or are mean to us. But we just love praise, and we just really love the slightest bit of fame we get. And this just fuels our egotism and our pride. And then we start telling ourselves what we're doing is for the benefit of our students, but really, in the back of our mind, all we're doing is just trying to think of how we can enrich ourselves. We can have more fun. We can gain more students, have more power. You know, we can take more drugs, have more girlfriends and boyfriends, that sort of thing. And that's because we're ordinary human beings. And you really shouldn't kid yourself on that you're not an ordinary human being. So when I see teachers like Rupert Spira and Eckhart Tolle, and whereas I think that they're quite genuine people and quite kind uh, and also quite humble, it seems. I mean, I don't know. I've never really been to one of their teachings, but they do on the outside seem quite humble. Uh, but the problem is, if you've got lots of students who start thinking they're awakened, then they, they also will start having strange behavior because there's a conflict there. There's a conflict between the reality of their being and what they claim to be. So as a human being, they're under the sway of their afflictions, right? They see something, they desire it, they want more of it. They see a, a beautiful boy or girl and then they fancy them. And they're under the sway of their normal uh, human afflictions, but at the same time, mentally, they're telling themselves that they're like awakened. And so if you put those two together, that's a recipe for disaster. And you shouldn't fall into this trap. And that's why we kind of gravitate towards um, famous teachers. So we're really worldly, right? We're completely worldly beings. And what do we look for? We look for a famous teacher. And also, if we've got a lot of desire, etc., then we look for a famous teacher who likes stuff. And I think this was the appeal of Osho, really. Because if you look at Osho, then he's wearing diamond watches and diamond bracelets and he teaches free love and, you know, that it's okay to get intoxicated and all that sort of thing. So he attracts people who are like-minded, people who are very desirous, who maybe enjoy getting off their head and they're really, like, attracted uh, to sexual partners. And so we see this famous teacher and he's also got kind of wild conduct and we get attracted or sucked into that because that resonates with our natural way of being. So the problem is, if we're not spiritually advanced, that's going to be a disaster, 100%. That's going to just ruin your life. You're going to spend a lot of time doing this and you might end up, you know, like some of Yosha students did, they end up doing some kind of horrible thing, like trying to poison a lot of people and end up in jail, right? 
totally ruin your life. And all, not only that, people think you're kind of a cult weirdo. And then if you're the teacher and you're not spiritually advanced and you attract all those sort of people, then in the back of your mind you're going to start thinking of all the ways you can use your students. You know, an authentic teacher isn't going to think about using their students or enriching themselves. They're not going to use that money to buy themselves a mansion, etc., buy lots of Rolls Royces and airplanes. Now, I just have to add something in here. I understand that there's this big Hindu tradition, it's especially prevalent in Nepal, where the guru is like an object of making offerings. And so you do your generosity towards that guru. Actually, this is a valid practice and it's a really good practice. But there, you need to have something in place there. If you're going to engage in this practice of like giving away all your possessions to the guru, you yourself have to have a very pure motivation. But also that guru has to have compassion. They have to be working for your benefit. Otherwise, you're just going to get used. And it happens so much. I mean, this is the story of Santana, right? The famous guitarist. He's a wonderful musician. But in the 60s, along with many other people, uh, they got kind of sucked into this whole guru worship thing. And he gave away like all his possessions. And now, I don't know if he's still alive. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I, when I heard about this, it was quite a few years ago, but he might be dead now. You know, now he really regrets it. And he's actually quite angry about it. So what you end up doing is you, you end up turning people into strange people or people who hate spirituality, you know, become jaded basically. So anyway, you know, there's not much we can do about the wheels of samsara, you know, instantly. I mean, if we just look at the unrelenting momentum of the world economies, you know, capitalism, military industrial complex, we can't just stand there and try to hold it back. We're not going to do anything whatsoever, you know. Uh, the best that most people can do is run away and go off to a commune somewhere, uh, off grid, etc. Uh, and I met somebody recently who had done this. Qu quite a few people in uh, Canada have experimented with this alternative way of living. Go somewhere off grid in a permaculture society. I think it's really wonderful. But don't kid yourself on that you can either stop the wheels of samsara or you can escape them, because you don't. I mean, this woman I met the other day, what they did is they had this kind of commune off-grid in California, and they grew cannabis and sold it uh, to generate resources. And with that money, then they bought like, you know, solar panels and wind turbines and things like that. So it's a way of trying to reinvent uh, the mundane world. But really, the process there is a commercial process, right? So you're, you're still wrapped up in it. Not only that, many people would see it, be, see it to be very negative to be selling drugs. You know, many people see it's like medicine, they think it's wonderful, but there's kind of all kinds of issues there, right? If you start providing drugs for people, I could say like I'm, uh, uh, I'm selling uh, fentanyl in order to raise money for humanitarian aid. It sounds great, but you know, in reality, it's messing a lot of people up. So a lot of people try to sort of uh, physically drop out of samsara. But you have to remember there's these three wheels of samsara and you may be able to kind of avoid uh, this physical wheel of samsara a little bit, uh, but avoiding the verbal wheel and the mental wheel is much more difficult. It requires spiritual practice. I mean, for myself, I, I want to build a meditation retreat, right? I want it to be a permaculture retreat. But to the extent which we can be self-sufficient is, is, is doubtful, because if people want to meditate all day long, they can't be farming all day long. So you have to find a balance. It's about finding a balance in the end. It's about the middle way, right? The only way to escape samsara, as it's taught in the Buddha Dharma, is to liberate your mind, is to liberate yourself from this mental wheel of samsara. That's the only way to do it. Uh, but along the way, then you just have to try your best, do your best, uh, not be complicit in the suffering of others. So, uh, but like I say, we're totally worldly, and it's, it's difficult to think, you know, we don't kid ourselves on that. We can actually stop the machinations of the, you know, capitalist society. It's not going to happen, uh, you know we're not strong enough. It's in their favor, basically. Everything is in the favor of the process of material progress and the perpetuation of this physical wheel of samsara. Our goal is to gain spiritual knowledge, and that is valid. Once you have uh, some control over this mental wheel of samsara, then naturally your verbal wheel of samsara will work for the benefit of others. If you have spiritual knowledge, and then everything you say becomes like nectar, Look at Krishnamurti, for instance, then his voice was like nectar to his students. And he, and he kind of focused them on a spiritual path just through this kind of induction, through this eloquence that he had. So naturally, when you have spiritual qualities, then this verbal wheel of samsara 
becomes, becomes purified and uh, works for the benefit of others. And then eventually, through liberation, uh, then also your activity, this physical wheel of samsara that you possess. We all possess it, right? All our activities are a wheel, a physical wheel of samsara. And so as we become purified spiritually, then our speech and also our actions naturally become similar to the actions of a Buddha. Eventually, uh, what manifests is the actual activity of an enlightened being. But until we get there, it's not possible. So my main point here is, uh, although we're beset uh, by the relentless momentum of a mundane life, is not to be disheartened. And also, um, you know, don't give up, but you need to be diligent. You need to develop spiritual knowledge and spiritual qualities. And don't fool yourself that, uh, that you're already Buddha and you don't need to do that. Because if you're already Buddha, then none of this will have any effect on you, you know, n n let alone the kind of industrial complex of capitalist society. And even a bus isn't going to run you over if you're a Buddha. Uh, you can't be harmed by these physical things. Uh, I better get to my gate. I've got another five hour flight before I get to Kathmandu. And when I get there, then I'll, I'll try to post a video from the stupa. I think that's really important. I need to introduce you to the great Bodhanath stupa. And so uh, thank you for your patience and I'll see you soon. Bye.